Good morning, everyone, and uh, good to see all of you. Uh, we have now three online uh, in-person students. Sorry, uh, Siddharth right has joined along with Asha and Kung, so all three of them here in the classroom with me, and it's uh, good to have Siddharth join us. But okay, let's begin. Can uh, one of you lead us in prayer, please? Anyone like lead us in prayer? Can anyone lead us in prayer, please? Abraham? Abraham Tete, can you lead us in prayer? Okay, very well. Okay, thank you. Okay, I mean, my network is having Hello, Pastor. Yes, uh, hi, Abraham. Uh, yes, please, can you hear me? Is my volume okay? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay, let's pray. Precious Father, we thank you for this hour. We thank you for this moment. Father, our hearts and minds are open to receive your word. Father, we pray for the grace that whatever we hear from our pastor this hour will be a blessing to us. That Father will not be hearers only, but will be doers of your word. That we will step out understanding the scripture and delivering it as you've given us. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we are praying. Amen. Amen. Thank, you. thank you, Abraham. Thank you, Say as well, for uh, just pitching in. Uh, but sorry, we uh, we just had Abraham pray. Okay, we'll, uh, we're looking at Romans. Uh, we are uh, in Romans chapter. Which chapter are we in? Which chapter are we in? Chapter 5. Thank you, Siddharth. Okay, so our in-person students are... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> have all answered chapter 5 okay so we were looking at chapter 5 we reached uh, to verse 17 so in chapter 5 Paul is basically talking about four outcomes of um, being justified by faith okay uh, so what are the outcomes of being justified by faith we have we have peace with God okay we are one with God uh, we are reconciled to God, we are no longer enemies of God, we are no longer fighting God, but we have peace with God, and we have the peace of God, okay? Uh, what is the second outcome? Access by faith into a standing in grace. That means we have a position where we are highly favored by God, okay? And we saw all the positions that we have uh, what it means to be standing in grace uh, to God we are, you know, we look at all the things that who we are to God. The third thing is that we are in a place of rejoicing, okay? Uh, we are rejoicing for the uh, you know, good things that God has planned for us and also the good things that he has planned for us in the future, okay? Uh, that he's going to release upon us the glory that he has kept for us. We also rejoice in tribulations, knowing that it develops endurance. Endurance develops character and character hope, okay? And then we saw uh, Paul goes on to talk about how God's love is being poured out into our lives, okay? That, um, and then we see uh, he talks about uh, Christ having died for me, what is the result? What is the result of Christ's death? Okay, because Christ died, we are justified by his blood. Paul says, he writes and he says, we're justified by his blood, we are saved from wrath uh, and judgment, and we are saved from eternal judgment. And then in verse 12, he tells us something more that has happened because of the cross. And, uh, you know, and I said that verses 12 to 21 is very unique. We don't find it anywhere else. Uh, in scripture, 
uh, he refers to Paul refers to this as the truth of uh, truth as identification. The truth that he's mentioning in verses twelve to twenty one, he's uh, referring it to as uh, uh, identification. This truth he's referring it to as identification, and he says that every person is affected because of the one man, Adam, and uh, he talks about because of what happened. As the consequences of one man, Adam, the the, the man Adam sin, and uh, how it affected the entire human race. And similarly, he talks about what happened, uh, uh, you know, with the other man, uh, which he refers to as the last Adam. Uh, so the the Adam that was born on the earth, you know, is uh, or God created, not born. He was created by God. Is called as the first man, uh, or the first Adam. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, Jesus Christ is referred to as the last Adam, the second man is also referred to as the second man. So we see what we inherited because of uh, the first man, Adam, um, all that we inherited, uh, how it affected the rest of our lives, the rest of human race. Similarly, we see how our lives are impacted or affected uh, because of what Jesus Christ did, who was the last uh, Adam or the second man. So Jesus Christ is available to the rest of the human race and what he has made available for each one of us. Now here in these verses 12 to 21, uh, you know, Paul is presenting a very interesting thought here. Uh, this passage is very unique uh, compared to, um, sorry, uh, this passage is very unique compared to, uh, you know, we don't see this uh, Paul writing about this or mentioning about this elsewhere in his letters, his epistles. He mentions a little bit about this in First Corinthians chapter 15, which we will look at. But Paul mentions here that he builds, uh, um, you know, that uh, what Paul mentions here, sorry, he builds on this in uh, Romans 6 on how it affects uh, the life of a believer today. Okay, so all that he's mentioning here, uh, he builds on uh, further in chapter six on how it affects a uh, believer today. So we looked up till that's a brief introduction. Uh, we looked, uh, uh, we, we examined um, chapter five verses one to 17. Uh, on Wednesday, we will look at chap uh, chapter five verses 18 uh, onwards uh, today. Okay, in our class today. Uh, so chapter 5, verse 80. Can somebody read that, please? Come on, read, madam. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Romans 5, uh, verses 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the, the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, Grace abound all the more, so that as sin reign in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. So here we see in verse 18, uh, you know, he's Paul is kind of repeating the same thing again and again, uh, because he's saying, you know, he's uh, writing it. Um, he's saying it again and again because he says, I really want you to get hold of this truth, which is our identification, okay, who we are. So in verse 19, he says, for as one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous, which is again, he's repeating the same thing. So if you look at your notes, uh, you know, there is, um, uh, you know, uh, two columns where it talks about um, uh, what Adam, uh, what we inherited from Adam and what happens as a result of us being in uh, Christ. 
okay so in adam in verse 15 it says adam sin brought death to many but jesus christ brought us the gift of grace okay so death came through adam uh, and through jesus christ we received a gift of grace to many verse 16 adam sin brought judgment and condemnation uh, and christ took all our sin and he justified us in God's sight. Okay, we are made just righteous. Verse 17, Adam sin brought us under subjection to death, but Jesus Christ released abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, which enables us to reign in life. Verse 18, Adam sin brought again judgment and condemnation, but Christ's uh, uh, work on the cross, his righteous act on the cross, brought the free gift of grace resulting in justification, righteousness, and eternal life. That is Zoe life, the God kind of um, life, the eternal life. And Adam's sin made all of us sinners, but Christ's obedience uh, makes all who believe righteous. So when we obey him, when we believe in him, you know, it makes us um, righteous. Okay, so this is what he's presenting the truth uh, as identification um, you know, our identification, who we are in Christ. When we are uh, uh, in Adam's race, we belong to the old nature, you know, uh, we belong to Adam's race, and what is our identification? And when we are born again, uh, we are born in Christ, you know, what is our identification? Uh, and I said that, you know, he also mentions about this, he writes about this in First Corinthians chapter 15, Verses 45 to 48. So let's uh, just briefly look at um, uh, that. So just keep your hand on, uh, you know, your your finger, one of your fingers on in Romans chapter 5. We'll be coming back to that. And you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 to 48, because uh, Paul is writing something very similar uh, about, you know, the first Adam, the last Adam, the first man, the second man. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 to 48, these are the only two places where he, um, you know, he writes about this and explains this truth. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 48. Can somebody read that, please? Pastor Kenny. Yeah, sure, please. Thank you. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last, uh, last Adam was made a cooking spirit. How by it, uh, that was not first which is spiritual, but that is which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of earth, the earthly, the second man is the Lord from the heaven. As the as is the earthly, such are they also that the earth that are earthly, and as is and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. Thank you. Pastor. Thank you, Sri Kumar. So here we see, you know, Paul drawing a simple picture like what we saw in Romans chapter 5. Uh, you know, and uh, here he's saying that um, Adam was a type of man that was to come. That is, he's talking, referring to uh, Jesus, just like Adam. Uh, you know, uh, in the same type, there will be a man who would come, and that is Jesus. And then he draws a contrast, as we saw in Romans chapter 5. And he refers to Adam here as the first Adam. And Jesus Christ is referred to here as the last Adam. Okay. So all those who are born of Adam were born in sin. Uh, with sin came uh, the death. Uh, and, uh, you know, while we are in Jesus, when we are born again, we become, uh, we are in Christ, you know, um, uh, and when we are in Christ, we don't have the sinful Adamic nature. That means our sinful Adamic nature is dead in us. Okay. Uh, and we see that uh, Jesus himself, even though he was born as a man, but, you know, he was not, uh, uh, he did not have the sinful Adamic nature in him because we see that uh, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, uh, so as uh, the last Adam, the sinful Adamic nature stops before him. Okay, what does that mean? So those of us in Christ, we are free from being identified with Adam spiritually. 
okay uh, of course we have the body of uh, uh, of man but in our spirit being we are made new we are uh, we have uh, uh, you know we have the nature of uh, uh, the last adam that is jesus christ we're being uh, made new in our spirit beings uh, and you know we are dead to sin okay so as the last adam the sinful adamic nature stops before him because you know in christ uh, when we are in christ you know, um, our sinful nature comes to an end. We are we are dead to uh, sin. We are dead to the power of sin. We are dead to uh, uh, the uh, the desire to sin. So those of us in Christ, we are free from being identified from Adam spiritually. In Christ, we are no longer having a sinful nature with sin and death working in our spirits. Okay, um, and um, and because of this, you know, it stops. Uh, the work of sin in our life okay so in christ we are born from above and because we are born from above we have the life and nature of god in us and we partake of the divine nature so in verse 46 he says he speaks of the natural and the spiritual uh, in the natural adam's race you know technically adam's race continues Okay, in the natural, people are still born in Adam's race, but spiritually in Christ, uh, you know, he is the last Adam. Okay, uh, which means, uh, you know, in Jesus Christ, there's no longer sin that continues. You know, those who are in Christ, they no longer have sin. Sin no longer reigns in their bodies uh, or in their spirit man. And we are dead to sin and we have the nature and we have the life of God in our uh, spirit man. Okay. In verse 47, he says, you know, he refers to Jesus as the second man. And he says the first man was natural, was of the earth. The second man is Jesus and he is from heaven okay so there is one race of people who are earthly and there's another race of people who are spiritual so those who are earthly are you know of the adamic uh, race the adamic line the the first man and those who are born into the kingdom of god those who are who accept jesus christ as their lord and savior you know they are um, uh, born of the you know they're part of the second adam the the race of the second man uh, or the last adam sorry um, and you know they are spiritual now because they are born from above okay so for those people who are born again you know the there's an end to the adamic race in their spirit man and uh, you know what does it mean when we say that uh, jesus is the second man it means it's the beginning of a new race okay a new race means when you know uh, a race there where there is no sin uh, where sin does not reign in our spirit man we are, have no inclination we have no desire to sin so jesus is the second man of the new race so people born of the second man are spiritual and they are born of heaven in verse 48 he says those who are natural they bear the image of man that is um, adam okay and they are like him Whereas, he says, Paul uh, writes, as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. Okay, so the spiritual people, you and I, we bear the uh, image of, the, of heaven. Okay, the image of the one who is from heaven, and that is Jesus Christ. So all of us who are spiritual, spiritual not, you know, there are many people in this world who are spiritual, but when we're talking about spiritual people here, we're talking about those who are in Christ. Okay, when we are born again, we are born in Christ. We'll explain that a little later. Okay, uh, we bear the image of the one who is from heaven, uh, who is Jesus Christ. And that is what the Holy Spirit does in our life. He, uh, you know, he works in our life. He sanctifies us so that we can be transformed into the likeness, into the image of God. In verse 49, he says, we shall also bear. Okay. But actually, if you look at it in the Greek, it does not have a future tense to it, but it says, we now bear. Okay. It says, we now bear. 
okay, uh, in verse 49, it says, and as we have borne the image of the dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. It's not something that will happen in the future that we'll bear the image of the heavenly man. But here in the Greek, it's uh, the present tense. Uh, it says, you know, um, we now bear the image of the heavenly man. So the moment we are in Christ, we bear the image of the, uh, you know, uh, heavenly man. What is the meaning of bear? It means, you know, uh, you know, it means let's show forth. You know, even as we are in Christ, we need to show forth through our words, our actions, our deeds, our very life, that we have the nature of the second man or the last Adam. Uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, walking or living or you know, uh, acting in Christ likeness, okay, or in the manner that Christ would have spoken or acted or uh, reacted. Now, in these verses, we see Paul doing a wonderful uh, contrast. Uh, he talks about uh, the first Adam, who is the first man, and he refers to him to also as the natural man. Uh, that is Adam who God created in the, uh, you know, in the beginning of the world, when he created the world on the seventh, uh, on the sixth day. And uh, the second man, uh, who he's referring to as Jesus, you know, uh, he's also calling him as the second Adam and as the spiritual man. And then he says that the first man, Adam, is, uh, or the first Adam is a man from the earth. The second Adam is a man from heaven, okay? And he mentions that in Adam we all die, but in the second Adam we all live, we all have life, okay? And we all bear the image of the second Adam. All those who are in Christ bear the image of the second Adam, uh, who is a spiritual man who is from heaven. Okay, so Paul is writing all this to explain um, to us, you know, what happens because we are in Christ or what happens because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Okay. Uh, any questions anyone has? You are able to follow? Yes, no. Okay. Okay, that yes. brings us to uh, chapter, end of chapter five. Anyone has any questions? Chapter five? Yes. Okay, so Kung's question is that uh, we are, when we are in Christ, we have the image of Okay. Oh, so I, I, this, I think, um, I hope I've understood Kung's uh, question right. I'll just mention to you. Uh, so Kung is saying that you know we are already made in the image of God because we read in Genesis. Uh, chapter 1 or chapter 2, you know, God created man in his own image, in his own likeness. Then if we are already created in God's image and we are already created in God's likeness, then why does it say that, you know, that, um, like I said in verse 49, that we also, uh, you know, have um, uh, the image of the heavenly man, okay? Uh, good question, Kung. So when God created, um, uh, was going to create Adam, uh, a, a man and woman, he said, let us create man in our image, okay, in our likeness. 
uh, which means that you know God has no form or shape because he is a spirit being but when he says he created us in his image and likeness it means that God does not sin so he created mankind never to sin uh, God is holy he created us holy God never dies he created us never to uh, die God has a mind to think he gave us a mind to think and to reason and to be able to understand him uh, God has a will you know he's sovereign he does what he wills he gave us a will to uh, choose okay but when um, so that is you know a uh, we are created in God's image and like this. But when Adam and Eve um, uh, sin, they, you know, they no longer have, they, the sin corrupted everything on earth. So they no longer were in the image or the likeness of God because God is holy, we were unholy. God is without sin, you know, uh, we were, uh, uh, you know, we, you know, sin came into this world and all, hence everyone born, uh, everyone born thereafter was born in sin. And also that, uh, uh, you know, uh, God never dies, but because of sin, death came into this world. So no longer having the image of God in us. Image of God also means we no longer were uh, manifesting the glory of God. Okay, glory, manifesting the glory of God means manifesting who he is and what he does. So God was actually in the garden, you know, he was actually releasing uh, his, unfolding his plan of his kingdom here on earth. And he wanted us to be representatives of his kingdom, to represent who the king is in his kingdom here on um, earth. Okay, and uh, so when we sinned, you know, sin corrupted everything. And hence, we moved away from the glory of God. We moved away from, you know, uh, bearing the image of God. We no longer could manifest the glory of God because of our sinful nature. But now, you know, Christ has made a way when Christ died for us on the cross. He took over, you know, he defeated sin and death and Satan and uh, gave us the keys of authority and the power. And um, hence, all of them who believe in the finished work of the cross, believe in Jesus, they no longer. Uh, you know they are no longer now belonging to the Adamic race okay uh, so they are born that's why we say we are a new creation we are, we, are, we are you know born again what does it mean we're born again means we're born again we made new in our spirit man and we are you know re remember what I said about um, uh, I think when I spoke about uh, propitiation and I talked about uh, redemption, redeeming God, redeeming us, you know, God did not just redeem us from the buy us out of the slave market by paying a cost, but he also redeemed us back to our original position. Okay, that is redemption and it's very beautiful and you can, when you read uh, the word redemption in, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the New Testament, there are various contexts which these Greek words are used and we need to read that in that context. So in some contexts, it is just, you know, we being redeemed from the slave market by paying a cost. And in other, you know, uh, context, it could be that we are redeemed back to our original position. So what is our original position? you know, in the image of God, to manifest his glory, to be like who uh, uh, Jesus is. And that is why the Holy Spirit is sanctifying us because he wants us to become more Christ-like so that, you know, we can be true representatives of him even as we are uh, heirs and, you know, of his kingdom and even as we are here now given the authority of his kingdom to advance his kingdom and further his kingdom here on earth. So did that help answer your question? Yes, sir, um, this one is we're talking about uh, us restoring back and God restoring us back to the conditions that we had in the Yes, yes. Anyone else has uh, any question? I saw somebody putting their hand up. Anyone else? Who put up their hand? Somebody put up their hand, right? Mangi, Mangi, are you there? Yes, yes, perfect. It is uh, I. I just had. I wanted to ask a uh, question, but you you answered it. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mangi. Anyone else has any question?
Okay, there are no questions, and we'll move on to uh, chapter six. Okay. And chapter six, Paul is basically writing or talking about sin's power uh, being broken over our lives, in our lives. Okay. So, uh, you know, based on the title of this chapter, what is Paul going to be talking about? Based on the title of this chapter, chapter 6, title is Sin's Power Broken. So what do you think uh, Paul is going to be talking about? Identity, okay, Siddharth says identity. Yes, he's continuing to focus on our identity, who we are. But what is he basically talking about? Okay, old nature is crucified with Christ. Anyone from the online class? Chapter 6, our topic is... Uh, okay, Sri Kumar says, no more bondage in, of sin, no more in bondage of sin, okay? He's basically talking about sin here, okay, and how sin's power is broken over our lives. Now, has already has Paul already spoken about sin in the previous chapters? Yes, no? Huh? Yeah, okay. You be sure about this. Yes, he's already spoken about it. So what has he already established about sin and salvation in the previous chapters? Okay, what is he already spoken about sin? Okay, salvation that we are a new creation, Christ. Okay, okay, okay. So he's spoken about um, how sin came through Adam. Uh, so you know, we see that he's already established the fact that we are all sinners, that Jesus died for our sins. Um, yeah, thank you, Elisha. Sin has come through Adam. Salvation came through Christ. Uh, the law exposes sin. Thank you, Fung. Yes, man has fallen short of the glory of God because of sin. Thank you, Sri Kumar. Okay. So we see that, you know, he's already, um, you know, established this fact that we are all sinners, that Jesus died for our sins. We are all uh, forgiven. And his righteousness has been uh, imputed on us or it has been put into our account. Hence, we have been made righteous with God. We've been justified with God. And we have a right standing in grace. Now, when he talks so much about sin and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and establish these truths, establish these facts, then why is he talking about sin here again? Okay. Anyone has any idea why is he talking again about sin? Because he's talking, he's dealt so much in depth about sin, you know, the consequences, how sin came, you know, what happened as a result of sin, what we've received as a result of the cross. And then why is he talking again about sin here in this chapter? Now, as I said in the introduction that, you know, in this letter is not uh, just written chapter-wise, uh, uh, you know, but it's like, uh, it's a letter. And so, you know, it, uh, the flow of thought is uh, running through. And then sometimes the person can go back on what they said initially. Uh, so Sri Kumar says he's trying to explain the solution of sin, okay? Um, First, our conscience convicts us on sin, okay? Uh, so as I said in the introduction that this is a letter and not written chapter-wise, so I mentioned that we need to have a forward and a backward look, right? So what he writes initially or what he introduces initially, say in chapter 1, he will further explain it in, you know, maybe some other part of his letter or for us it's chapter wise, so he will explain it uh, and build on it uh, later. So similarly, when interpreting something in a 
you know, chapter uh, that comes later on, uh, we need to maintain a backward look, which means we need to interpret it in the light of what we have studied, we have learned so far in chapters one to chapter five. We look, need to look at it in the context in which it was introduced and what else has been stated on this in the, uh, stated on this previously by Paul. So chapter three, Paul talks about sin, he says, all have sinned and we are justified and made righteous by faith. And just like, uh, you know, he raised several questions there to bring about the truth. Similarly, he raises some questions in this chapter or in this part of the letter as well. Okay. So in this chapter, Paul addresses the main issue, uh, you know, or the main issue or the main problem, uh, main issue of the problem of sin. Okay. So in this uh, uh chapter Paul addresses the main issue of the problem of sin. Okay, he says we are all sinners, Jesus died for our sins, we are all forgiven, his righteousness is imputed on us or is put into our account, hence we are righteous, we are justified, we have a right standing with grace. But in spite of all this, in spite of knowing all this, receiving all this, then why do we still continue to sin? Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, some people say that, uh, you know, maybe, you know, in his time, uh, you know, people were continuing to sin because they were saying, because we have the grace of God. Okay, we have the grace of God, we've already been justified, we've already been forgiven. So even if we sin and we go and ask God for forgiveness, he will justify us again because he'll forgive us, his forgiving God, and his grace is, we're living in the grace period, you know. Uh, and I've heard many people, and it's very shocking and very sad, um, you know, when we point out uh, sins of uh, people, they get um, they get very upset with us, especially even our loved ones, you know, when you point out their sin and tell them, you know, this is not honoring in God's sight, uh, they tell us, you know, uh, who are you to judge because, you know, uh, God is gracious. He is merciful to me. He loves me. Uh, he he will forgive me. So there's no point. There's no need for you to uh, judge my sin or uh, tell me what I'm doing is wrong. And they're taking the grace of God for um, granted. Okay. And uh, so I think this was also running through the minds of uh, you know the people there uh, uh, when Paul was writing. And so he says, in spite of all this, why do we still continue? Uh, to sin because some people say we have the grace of God, we've been justified and forgiven. But when we do that, we are taking the grace of God for granted. Okay. And then we see that, you know, in this chapter, he transitions to how we need to live our Christian life. How do we live in the view of the cross and what has happened at the cross? Okay. Uh, so, what actually Paul is bringing to us. Uh, uh, um, in Romans 6 is an in-depth understanding again of the truth of identification just like Siddharth uh, said you know he's uh, bringing an in-depth understanding of the truth of identification he's already done quite a bit of it and built on it in um, Romans chapter 5 uh, where he's spoken about in Adam how uh, you know uh, what we receive uh, and when we are in Christ you know uh, what is our identification what is our standing what we have received and now he addresses the main issue of the the problem of sin in two main questions. The first thing he says, shall we continue to sin uh, or shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 1. Or in and verse 15 he says, shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace. So, so he's going to um, address the main issue of the problem of sin by answering two main questions. The first one is, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 1. And then shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace, verse 15. Now to answer these two main questions, he has some follow-up questions. So for each of the uh, two questions, he has two follow-up questions that points to the spiritual truths that he wants to, you know, bring about to us. So the first question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He asks two more follow-up questions. And that is, how shall uh, we who died to sin live any longer in it? And do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Verse 3. Now, the second main question 
shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace he has two more follow-up questions for that in verse 16 and verse 21 says do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey you are that one slave whom you obey whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness the second follow-up question is in verse 21 where it says what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed now so as paul responds to these two main questions he introduces us again to the truth about identification uh, and how that uh, has set us free from the dominion or the power of sin okay um, and uh, he also talks about what should be our response to god's grace okay he says our response should be that we willingly make ourselves slaves uh, to God and slaves to righteousness, which results in holy living before God. Okay, so this is just a brief background, and now we will look in detail. Uh, we will study chapter six. So, can one of you please read uh, chapter six, verses one, two, and three, please? Chapter six, verses one, two, and three. Chapter okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, Romans chapter 6, 1, 2, and 3. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, by no means, how can we do, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do we do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Thank you. So uh, we see that, you know, Paul having presented the powerful truth that we are justified by faith um, and that where sin abounded, grace abounds all the more. Uh, Paul addresses a question that, you know, uh, people could possibly raise. Uh, and that question is, shall we all just keep on sinning so that God can keep giving us more and more grace? And what is the answer? He says, he gives an answer. Does he give an answer? Yes. Yes. What is the answer? By all means, no. By all means, no. Yes, in verse 2, it says, certainly not. Absolutely no. And uh, why does he say, uh, you know, uh, certainly no or absolutely no? It's because we are dead to sin. Okay? Dead people do not sin and they cannot sin. Okay? Uh, and so he says, because we are dead to sin, you know, we are dead to sin, that's why we cannot sin any longer. Okay, and he says that when we are baptized into Christ, we are baptized into his death. So, what baptism is he talking about here? Is he talking about water baptism or some other baptism? Talking about water baptism, anyone else? We're looking at so. Uh, Verse 3, where it says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So is he talking about water baptism or some other baptism here? Other? Kung is saying other, okay. Good try. Yes, he's not actually talking about water baptism, you know, um, but he is um, talking about spiritual baptism here. Okay, so why do we say it's spiritual baptism? Because he says we have been baptized into Christ. Okay, uh, Rose says baptism in the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, it's um, not water baptism. It's um, not, you know, baptized into the Holy Spirit where we get the gifts of the Spirit and we flow in the gifts of the Spirit, we speak in tongues. But this is more spiritual baptism. Uh, because, um, you know, it says here that we are baptized into 
Christ. Now, to understand what Paul is saying, uh, we need to look at uh, you know the other epistles, other letters that he's written where he is mentioned about this, so that we can interpret uh, rightly in the context what we are uh, reading. Because one scripture helps us to interpret another scripture, understand it, and so it's important to use other scripture as well. So he writes about this in First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse thirteen. So can all of you? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. And can somebody read that, please? Anyone? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one spirit, for all baptized into one body, that every chooser reads. And their slaves are free. And all have been sorry, all have been made to thank you to one spirit. Thank you, Kung. So he says, you know, um, uh, it, it says here that uh, you know, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Okay, so it's the Holy Spirit that baptizes us into the body of. Christ. We're not baptized in water, but we are baptized in Christ. Now, yes, water baptism is a physical expression of Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Okay, yes, we use this. Uh, uh, it is a physical expression of, um, you know, of verse 3 here. But the spiritual significance or the spiritual truth is it's a spiritual baptism. Okay, uh, water baptism is a physical expression of the spiritual reality of the spiritual truth that we are going to see here. So what he's focusing here is the spiritual truth. Okay, the spiritual truth is that all of us believers have been baptized into Christ or we have been brought into Christ, we are immersed into Christ, we are put into Christ or we are clothed into uh, Christ. So when you say that we are baptized, you know, it's a powerful expression, it's a powerful proclamation of the spiritual truth of our identification with Christ's death, burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and his seated, uh, his uh, you know, him seated at the right hand of God, or uh, the seating of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, um, just before we end, I'll just uh, uh, explain something and then just give me one or two minutes. This is something, uh, you know, for us to understand that Christ, you know, died 200 years back, or sorry, 2000 years back. And here we are 2000 years later, uh, when we hear the gospel, when we believe in Jesus Christ, uh, when we do, we are baptized into Jesus Christ. So today we are immersed into Jesus Christ spiritually. That means we are brought into Christ or we are immersed into Christ. And God's saying that I'm going to treat you as though you were in Christ 2000 years ago. So what happened to Christ 2000 years ago becomes effective in our body, becomes effective in our lives today. And how is that possible? Uh, you know, we already uh, spent time explaining it in uh, Romans chapter 5 because of Adam, you know, and we being in Adam, because Adam sinned, all of us have sinned, um, and that came upon us because of uh, Adam's sin. We're all affected by what happened to Adam 6,000 years back because of one man's disobedience, you know, we are all born in sin and we are all destined to die. So the same truth continues here that the moment we accept Christ, you know, we are in Christ, we identify with Christ, we identify with his death. So spiritually we are made one with Christ and because we are made one with Christ or baptized into Christ, we are baptized into his death. We identify with his death. And then he goes on to talk about uh, uh, further in this chapter that we not only identify with his death, but we also identify with his burial, with his resurrection, uh, with his ascension, and with him being seated uh, in, in heavenly places. Okay, we'll stop here and uh, we'll move on with, uh, um, with uh, verse 4 of chapter 6 uh, next Wednesday. Anyone has any questions?
Anyone has any questions? Okay, no questions. Okay, so uh, we've already discussed about our uh, test, right, assessment? Okay. Okay, if there's no more questions, then, uh, or if there's no questions, sorry, then we can end class. Thank you all for uh, joining class. Have a blessed weekend and a refreshing weekend, and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.